And the people that can't wait until then to get more Steve Adcock in their life, can you uh, tell them <laughs> where, where can they find you? What's the best, what's the best place to, to look you up? Well, to get more Steve Adcock in your life, um, <laughs> there are two main, main avenues. A millionairehabits.us is the website for my brand. On Twitter, I'm at Steve on Speed. <laughs> Steve on Speed. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, 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 yo. My name is Jonathan Steers. My co-host is Doug Diakite, and we welcome you to Find Your Freedom, the best entrepreneurship podcast. Being an entrepreneur is hard. That's why we created findyourfreedompod.com to compile all the resources you need to find your own freedom. Today, we're joined by Steve Adcock, the author of upcoming book, Millionaire Habits, an avid outdoorsman, XIT professional that retired at the age of 35 and now teaches the habits of millionaires to over 30,000 people every week through social media and his newsletter. Welcome to the FYF pod, Steve. Thank you very much for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Steve, I, I, I love your story. I love how you grinded hard through your 20s. You're an IT professional. And then I love that just randomly someone reached out to you through all these years of work now on your social media. And they're like, hey, can you please write us a book? Please write us a book. And now it's coming out in a couple months. Um, can you talk us a little bit about, uh, about how one of the things that you talk about all the time that I think is just super interesting and I think can be a little um, catch some people off guard. You talk about healthy selfishness. I think that's such an interesting spot to start. Can you kind of talk us through what people hear that, how they react and how you kind of uh, counter that? Ab absolutely. Yeah. And, and when people hear the term selfish, th most people think of it as, you know, in a negative kind of kind of terminology. And I, I totally get that. I probably would have too in a previous life. But the fact is, you're going to be in a much better position to help others, to give back in your community, to, I don't know, build a huge career, to do the things that are going to work for you, to, to volunteer your time for those who need it. If you are not in a position of weakness, which means you're never worrying about money. You're never worrying about, about putting food on the table. You're never worried about being overweight or, or un unhealthy in general. When you have your personal foundation on point, that is when you have the time, you have the confidence, you have the motivation to start getting involved in the things that you care about. And that is when you start giving back. That's when you start volunteering. That's when you start getting involved in all these projects that might not make you money, but they do ultimately help your friends, your family, your community. So it all starts in my humble opinion, it all starts with yourself and building a healthy, solid, strong foundation for you because that's going to put you in a much better position to start making an impact in your community. What immediately comes to mind, let me just jump in with one thing. What immediately comes to mind, and you probably thought of this, heard this a million times already, but uh, is when they tell you on the airplane to make sure you put your mask on first before you mess with the neighbor's mask and your children's mask. Exactly. There's, it's, um, you're, you're <laughs> not going to be of any help to your neighbor if you're dead. And that's really what it comes down to when, <laughs> when they talk about your oxygen mask. You, you got to help yourself first. You got to put yourself into the position to help somebody else right. first. So you can't always think about helping. I know that sounds so weird and I might come across as a dick when I say that, but you know what? I don't care. This is, this is just the way it is. You, you can't always think about yourself if you are hurting yourself at the same time. That just can't happen. Yeah, I, I, it totally makes sense to me the way you explain it like that. I, so Doug was thinking of the airplane situation. I'm he sitting here thinking about just Maslow's hierarchy, right? Like you have to have your basic needs met. Once your basic needs are met, then you're able to thrive and do more for other people. Um, and I think that this is like such a great place to start, uh, sort of unplanned, but now it makes me look kind of good. So I appreciate that, Steve, is like the basic needs of thriving and finding your own freedom start with 
your own health, physical, mental, and also, you know, meeting, you know, all the basic needs of making sure you're not worried about being able to pay your rent, buy your groceries, make sure your kids have everything they need. If you meet all those things, then it's like, yeah, you have so much more bandwidth in your mind to concentrate on like, oh, am I able to go do the hom homeless feeding this week? Or, oh, there's someone on the side of the street needs help. Or my neighbor needs help moving. I definitely have freedom and time to go help them with those things. So the way you're saying this healthy selfishness to me is like, oh, this is like a no brainer. Um, I can see how that could be resonating with your 30, 40,000 Twitter followers and your huge uh, following on your newsletter now. So, yeah, I mean, if if you're worried about your basic needs, man, that's that's that you you have put yourself into the position of not really helping anybody, including yourself, including yourself. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And now can you parlay that? So I want to just kind of start with that basic thing that seemed kind of controversial that you talk about. And now I want to expand that our audience is all here trying to really um, follow with you on this guy is teaching about these habits of millionaires. He got approached by a publisher to write a book about it. Can you talk to our audience about how you kind of work that all in together to make it uh, wrapped up in a nice little package? To, to publish a book? Yeah, they initially reached out. First of all, I had no interest in being an author. Zero, absolutely none. I had, That just never crossed my mind. Um, but the more they reached out, the more I thought about it. And, you know, being an entrepreneur you really have to think long term down the road things that you might not want to do now might still be a good idea because of the opportunities that those things will provide to you later so ultimately that's why i said yes because i mean being a published author that's i mean i wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily say it's a big deal but it is a, a little feather in your cap and those things pr uh, provide opportunities for the future yeah, it's a small percentage of people in that group. Yep, yep, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So what what I did is they initially wanted it to be um, healthy selfishness in general, an entire book about healthy selfishness. And, you know, I could write forever on that topic, but we kind of meshed it into healthy selfishness as well as financial independence. So you're getting your personal foundation in place first, then you're taking that next step to saving money to investing money to building wealth and that is where this whole like everything comes together when you could put all these pieces into place so you are not only strong you're not only confident you have your personal shit in order then you just take that natural next step to say okay what am i going to do now am i going to continue working for the rest of my life or am i going to travel for the rest of my life you know what whatever that looks like to you it doesn't matter. The important part is to know what that looks like to you and then work backwards yep. from there. Once you have that end goal, then you work back. If you don't have that end goal, and guess what? Most people don't. I didn't either for the longest time. I had no idea what I wanted my future to, uh, to look like. But once you understand that, once you have that light at the end of the tunnel, then everything becomes easier because you know the steps you have to take in order to get there. All right, Steve, I want to just take this quick opportunity to tell you your energy has been amazing so far. Let's, uh, let's keep it rolling here. Um, we've had, we've had it all over the, the spectrum from people that come on the program and say, you know, I always knew from the moment I was born and could speak and walk that I was going to become an entrepreneur and others who are more accidental <laughs> entrepreneurs who, you know, they just kind of fall into it when they like lost their last job and they're like, what do I do now? So where do you fall into that spectrum? When did you first consider entrepreneurship for yourself and career? Definitely by accident. I, I worked a 14 year career in information technology and my, my background is financial independence and early retirement. So that was my initial goal. I just want to quit working for somebody else, quit working on other people's problems because I don't care about their problems. I care about <laughs> mine. I would rather spend time <laughs> focusing on me, working on my problems. I guess that goes back to the healthy selfishness thing. So, okay. So in, this was 2016, I finally quit. I finally was able to, you know, quote unquote, retire early. Um, so we traveled the country for a living, but in, in an Airstream RV, like we sold both of our homes, that was our house. And we just traveled for a living. And as I did that, and I kind of knew this was going to happen, but I wasn't sure how the pieces were, uh, were going to fall into place. I needed to have something to do. 
with, with, with my time. And it couldn't just be a hobby. That just doesn't sit with me. I cannot spend the rest of my life as a 35 year old doing no, even if you are doing something, but you're not earning anything, you're not generating any income, there's no cash flow, that just didn't sit well with me. So the the ideas started to, to percolate slowly. One of the things I really did well was write. I started a blog. I since sold the blog in 2019 for six figures. That was a complete accident too. But it happened. And that I, I think that was really my first exposure, like selling the blog to – um, I guess realizing that I had this within me, I had no idea I was going to be an entrepreneur. In fact, arguably I didn't even want to, but I just kind of fell into that. Well, I, I can't say I fell into that success. I worked really, really hard on that blog, but selling it wasn't necessarily my goal. It just happened. So I think that was my first exposure to this could happen. Maybe I could, maybe I could make more money doing this than I ever did in my career. And that would be a really magical experience. Absolutely. Uh, sounds super magical. Let's back up for just one second here. Cause I think a lot of times when we're, um, uh, interviewing the guests, it's like, okay, I'm at my corporate job preparing for my escape and preparing for the, my entrepreneurial journey. And it sounds like with yep. yours, you had just saved up enough money to retire and it wasn't leaving the corporate world to start a business. It was leaving the corporate world to retire and cruise around in an RV. And then when you're in the RV, it hits you like, I got to do something with my life other than continue uh, on this road trip here. So um, so am I getting that right? And then yeah, you kind of exactly. started getting the the bug to, to begin writing. And then, yep. yeah, so very, very much accidental. Yeah, it, I guess it's a hobby of mine to make money on my terms from anywhere in the world. That's such an amazing freedom to have. Yeah. So anywhere I go, regardless of what phase of my life I'm, I'm in, I'm always going to look for a way to do that because I remember when I did have to commute into the office, sit in that cold 62 degree office. It seemed like it was so <laughs> freaking cold in that office every single day, dead of summer, 110 outside, 62 inside. Anyway, I digress. I know what that felt like. Right. And I always had to be there. And yep. then I get my W2, my, my, my paycheck. Then I had to yep. be there again. And like this, this rotating cycle of doing things I don't want to do. And it didn't fit with what you wanted. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I just got, I mean, I was tired of it. I'll be honest with you. From the very first day I set foot into an office, like from college, I was 24. I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to work with, I'm going to make lots of money, work with all these geniuses, these, these professionals. And you know, I'm going to start building my career. Yay. Let's do this. From the very first day I started doing that, I looked around the office and people were just kind of robotically going through their day, just kind of stumbling around, not, not really caring. It's like, this is it. I have another 40 years of doing this. There's no freaking way that's going to happen. Now, at that point, I didn't have early retirement in, in my mind. I had, I had none of this figured out. But I did understand that there was no way I can go through the rest of my productive life doing this. So where did the early retirement idea come into play? Was it like five years, 10 years before you retired? And you're like, if I save X amount every year, I'll be free? How did that materialize? That's an interesting question. My dad actually told me right after college, some people are on the 10 year plan. That's what he said. Some people are on the 10 year plan, which means you basically live like a college student for the next 10 years in your career right. and you just save, you invest, you don't spend money on anything. And then you quit after 10 years and do whatever the hell you want to do. Now at, at that, at that point in my life, I was finally making money. I wanted to spend some, I wanted to enjoy it. So I didn't put myself on the 10-year plan until about, I don't know, I'd say five or six years in. That's when the rubber met the road. And I, I really started to make some changes because I didn't necessarily hate my life, but I knew that this couldn't continue. There was just so much missing. There was so much more that I thought I could be doing with my time. So 
I found a blog called Mr. Money Mustache. Anybody in the personal finance community probably knows that name. Yeah. He was a software developer. I was a software developer. So he and I, I mean, his blog, his writing style, he cussed on his blog. I do that all the time. As you probably know, he and I just clicked. There was a lot of similarities between Kindred us. spirits. Exactly, exactly. So I, I, I read everything he wrote and I really got inspired by his story. And that's ultimately why I started my blog because I Very wanted cool. to inspire other people the way that Mr. Money Mustache inspired me. And the pieces slowly started to, to um, fit into place at, at that point. I got to jump in real quick here. Your, your dad just sounds like such a wise person. I don't know very many people who have received that advice going out of college. And I just heard a quote uh, last week that I was talking to one of my mentees about. And the quote was, um, your 2030 lifestyle will be determined by your 2023 decisions. And it's like, I was telling that I was, I was, I was, I had seen it on Instagram and I was talking to one of my mentees about it because he's uh, out of college and working this corporate job. And he is kind of like feeling what you are feeling. And I was just saying, like, just know, like, your lifestyle you're living right now, both how much you make right now, how, how would you work, and how much you save set aside is all going to set you up for your next five, 10 years. And, and you're going to have a completely different lifestyle based on how you do those two things right now. So hearing your dad say that just sounds such an impactful thing to say to someone coming out of college. And, and it sounds like it really resonated with you and, and, and changed your outlook to understand like, hey, I don't have to be locked into this for 40 or 50 years. Eventually it did. When you, when you knew yeah. on day one that you, uh, that you weren't happy in that situation. <laughs> and I, I, I have the advantage of watching. I mean, my dad is the smartest person I know by far. Two master's degrees, majored in math, majored in math. I mean, come on. Anyway, <laughs> he grew up in a... Re- I wouldn't say poverty, but I mean, it was it was a it was a poorer family. Um, built himself up literally from nothing. Did not have help. Nobody paid for his. Co- I mean, his parents didn't pay for his college. He did join the Navy, so the Navy paid for one of his postgraduate degrees. Um, but I got to witness everything that's possible if you just work your ass off and you know what you want. Those two things actually in reverse order, you know what you want, then you work <laughs> your ass go. off to, right. to get it. Those two things, once you have those two done, man, there is nothing. And I, I cannot stress this enough. There is nothing that's going to stop you from achieving whatever you want to achieve. Yeah. I think that one of the interesting things that you keep going back to is these habits that you learn from your dad. And it sounds like Mr. Money Mustache. Can you talk through our audience? A lot of them are aspiring entrepreneurs, kind of sound like you were in your 20s or even in in that college life. Can you talk through some of the most common habits that you've included in your in your new book that's about to be published and that you've put in all these blogs over the years, the most impactful ones that you think someone can apply that can change their uh, trajectory to be on on target for getting where they want to be in 2030? Sure. And I I alluded to this a a little bit before. The very first step before anything else happens is you have to know where you're going. Otherwise, you're just going to be wandering around aimlessly. You cannot save money for no reason. I fell into that trap when when I was younger. I felt like I had to save 10%. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm just saving (laughs) it. For something. And and for, for something, yes. And if I wanted something, it's like, I have a little extra money here. I'm just going to take just going to take a little bit from that category and buy something that's completely unrelated to that category. Did that all the time. Cheated my budget like crazy. So once you have that goal, and for me, it, eventually it was early retirement. For you, it might be traveling the world or or paying for your your, your child's college education, wh- whatever it is. Once you have those things like earmarked, these categories of spending in the future and what you see your life, what you predict your life looking like, then you can work backwards from there. You can start saving, you can start investing, you can start maybe changing your your career, saying yes to more opportunities. And those things will build and help you to achieve your goals. But if you don't have a reason to save, guess what? You're probably not going to do it. So how are, I'm just trying to really um, make this as simple as possible for the audience. Are you saying, have these goals in your mind? Are you saying we need to be uh, like you guys need to be writing this down. You need to be really like every month, every quarter or something updating 
Are you how exactly how micro are you getting on these things, and what is the best practices you'd recommend for them to make sure that they can have, come to fruition? It depends on how bad you want it, and it depends on what your timeline is. So if you don't want it all, then just like a quick light note. But if you really actually want it to happen, <laughs> maybe yeah. If you actually want it to happen, and you want it to happen like soon. My, my wife and I did worked backwards from our early retirement goal. This was in 2013, 2014-ish. And we did, we saved. So both my wife and I worked full-time jobs in information technology. So we were pulling down like 220 Gs by the end of our careers back right. in 2015. That's good money now. That was especially good money then. Right. And we saved 100% of my salary and lived on half of my wife's salary. That adds up super quickly. Right. Especially early in your life. Crazy. Exactly. Exactly. We could have told you how much money we spent on sweet potatoes, how much money we spent on <laughs> grapes for those two years, like individual items. Now, I'm not saying you have to go to that detail. You don't. You really, That's really That's a little don't. aggressive. Maybe just know how much money you spent on groceries. <laughs> exactly. But my wife is a rocket scientist, like an actual rocket scientist. I'm clearly mm. married up. So she's a very numbers person and she wanted to see that kind of data. So that's cool. I mean, if you want to do that, more, more power to you. Right. Um, so we were very aggressive. We talked about it every single night. We would have dinner, then we would go out and walk our dogs in the neighborhood, and we would talk about our future, what we wanted it to look like, what we wanted to do, and that helped two things. One, solidify what our future was going to look like, and two, work backwards from there and figure out, okay, this is how much money we have to we have to save every single month. We need to keep doing it. We need to keep keep doing it because every once in a while, you you might fall off the way you, you know, you something you, you want to buy. There's a good deal on this, whatever. And I'm not saying you have to completely sacrifice all the fun things in your life. Not at all. You, your life can't, can't look like a sacrifice or feel like a sacrifice. Right. But if you keep talking about those things with your significant other, or if it's just you talk to yourself, that's going to keep your goals firmly planted in your mind. So when that opportunity does come around where you can, buy a, you know, a $15,000 cruise, then you could think to yourself, this would be fun, but I want to do this in two years. What is that 15 grand going to do? Is it going to make my life hell for the <laughs> three months before it? Or am I going to be just fine spending that, that 15 K? Yeah, that makes, that's brilliant. Um, so really starting with the goals, um, it sounds like somehow you get with writing the goals down, tracking your spending, what piece in there helps that be more actionable for people to make those real, the, those, those goals uh, come through? Are you guys uh, using apps for that? Um, is there certain dollar figures you're trying to, to set goals on? Um, it was, we used financial automation. And if you're not automating your finances, you're spending way too much time doing this. <laughs> it, it, it really does come down to that. So you set it and forget it. So what we did is in both of our jobs, we maxed out our 401ks. We maxed out our Roth IRAs. And we just used our company's, um, uh, our payroll automation system to just funnel money from our paycheck. Happened automatically. We never had to lift a finger. It just it just happened. And then we, we took the next step. We opened up a Vanguard brokerage account because we wanted to invest more than just our 401k and Roth IRA. Mm -hmm. So we set up monthly automated transfers from our checking account into our brokerage account. Again, we set it up once, that's it. And I think we contributed like $1,000 a month or something um, automatically. And then we also did that again for our emergency fund. So we saved, by the end, we had two years, which is way more than I would recommend most people do, quite frankly. Right. But we had two years of living expenses in cash. Right. And we, we accumulated that much money by using automation. That I cannot stress automation enough. You set it up once, you forget about it, you don't have to use discipline, you don't have to remember to make all of these money transfers. You set it up once and, and it just happens. It makes everything so much easier. I'm so glad I, I'm so glad I asked that question because I think what you just said is what makes that so powerful is that it actually helps you be disciplined because it removes a layer of decisions where you're like, oh, well, I have I see this money in my account. I need to you know, spend it somewhere. So I think that's a really cool 
almost like a trick for people like, hey, if you have it automatically transferred out and set aside as this is my investing money or this is my um, you know, rainy day money, my emergency fund, then they don't even need to see it and it, and it just removes one layer of decision making. Um, yeah, I think that's powerful. Great, great, great advice. Yeah, it's it's like Tim Ferriss's four hour work work week. You're basically outsourcing the things that should should happen regularly, but you don't want to spend the the uh, the time doing. So in this case, you're just outsourcing a lot of your financial life, so you just never have to think about it. Yeah, outsourcing the yeah the time and the the bandwidth and that's right, man. So many important hacks and um and little tricks and strategies and habits in there it's clear how, why you were able to retire at such a young age. And I think I read somewhere too, and you're, you put together a list and it sounds like you married right and got a partner who you can discuss all these things with and, and um, having those frequent conversations to get on the same page on the path to get there and what you both want. And um, I think a lot of people probably don't spend that time with their spouse talking very much about where are we going to be in five years? Where are we going to be in 10 years? And if you're not talking about it and visualizing it together, you're sure as hell probably not putting a, um, a plan together <laughs> to, to get there. Right. <laughs> so communication is so key. So yeah, you really uh, laid out some, you know, exactly like what it does actually take. And I know that some people watching and listening are going to say, Oh, well he, he, they made six figures and it's so easy for them. Now, is it going to take you longer if you make less money? It probably will. But I think the, the point still remains that if you, even if you have a lower salary, you're still, you know, adjusting your lifestyle so that you are putting away a certain percentage. And even if it takes you longer, you can still eventually get there, even if you make less money. Yeah. So one of the things going back and looking at your background, Steve, um, that really stood out to me is you got this guy who's been working in tech for all these years and um, all these high level tech jobs. And um, when you think of a tech person and then you think of a creative writer type person, that those are kind of like, in my mind, like two different people. Um, so how does, how does writing become your skill that you ended up leveraging and monetizing? You spoke to it, touched on it briefly a little bit earlier, but how does that become the big thing that ends up in your retirement becoming the thing that you leverage and monetize? This is something that I talk about in my book too. There's a, um, a distinct difference between your strengths and your passions. So my career is in, in information technology, a lot, a lot of computer science, writing code. That was my strength. I followed what I was good at. And I still think I'm good at writing, but that was a high paying skill. So Ooh. it was smart for me to follow that high paying skill as my career. But writing has, has always really been a passion of mine. I didn't do a lot of it during my career, I started started my blog, I think, two years before I quit. So I was kind of getting into it. But I had a long history of blogging for free. I never expected anything, didn't want to like fill it with ads or affiliate marketing. I didn't have any of that. So my path to monetization was a little weird. In fact, I didn't necessarily even want it to happen, but it just did. The more I wrote, the more traction I got, the more the more people viewed my, my blog and gave, gave comments and interacted with me. And it just sort of built, it built up from there. And this was around the time where I really wanted to quit my job and we were really focused on money. And it's like, are we going to have enough? You know, what, what's going to happen here? How can we pull in more, more money later if we need to? And then it's like, oh, I have this, I have an audience that I've built over many, many years. I can probably start monetizing this in some way. So I did start small with display ads. I started an email newsletter where I did some sponsorships there. So it just kind of built from there, built from, from that point. I did not have some grand plan. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs would probably fall into the same kind of category. I had nothing in place. I really didn't have anything written down, to be perfectly frank. I just kind of did it. I, I went with it and tried different things, and I just saw what worked. I doubled down on what worked and just forgot about what didn't. And slowly but surely, over the course of many months and many years, that income just started to build and build and build. Eventually, I did sell, sell, my, uh, sell my blog now. But today, I mean, I get paid... $150 an hour just to write articles about money takes maybe three hours of my day. 
max. Like that is it. Usually it's usually it's like 45 minutes to an hour. Sometimes it does take up to three hours. So I've gotten to that point where it's a lot easier now. Um, but yeah, it certainly didn't, it certainly, certainly didn't start with this grand master plan where I just followed it and, you know, it just, it just worked. Um, it was a lot of trial and error. I love how you distinguish between the skill that you used for your career to get free and retire. And then this passion of writing those two different things and, and, and how you viewed the one versus the other. And with the writing sounds like more of a passion that wasn't intended to be a business when you started writing and then later, um, blossomed into, you know, what it's become and has been very fr fruitful for you. Um, but only after you just kind of started writing out of pure passion and fun and enjoyment. Um, so it became a business though. So this passion, you took it and, and ran with it. What, aside from the writing, what do you, what do you see as your, as your superpower in business when you think about how, how you ended up monetizing it? That's a good question. I don't think I, I don't think I have a super, well, okay. I'll, I'll say it this way. My superpower is trying, just throwing a bunch of stuff against the wall and just seeing what, seeing what sticks. I'm a big trial and error. Just, you got to try junk and double down on what works. Don't double down on what doesn't. Of course, that is what I do. That's what I've always done. I've never been a planner. I don't sketch out. I don't write notes to my, no, just none of that. I keep nothing, no notes. I'm not suggesting this is how you should do it, by the right. way. This is just the way I do it. I am a very, very big proponent of just getting out there, getting your feet wet, getting involved and seeing what happens, keeping your eyes open for opportunities and just build slowly but surely over time. Could I have made money faster? Yeah. Probably could, but at this point, I really don't need to. And it was a more organic process uh, for me to go from a free blog, basically just uh, volunteering my time on my own blog, just writing, to where I am now. Um, it was a it was a lot of just it was it was a lot of just getting out there, trying stuff, and seeing what what worked. It was it's really not more technical than that. I like that. What a cool organic way of doing it, not forcing anything and just having things happen as you're trying it. And like you said, throwing it up against the wall. I think that's a really cool piece of the story. Uh, one of the questions that we like to ask every guest on the pod is how you would personally define entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship to me is working on a project that you feel passionate about, whether it's for money or not. Usually it is, of course, but it that's all it is. Working on a project, your project, not somebody else's, working on your project that you feel passionate about. That's it. I love that. It's super good. Um, yeah, I love how it's such a personal thing for everyone. We've gotten such a range of answers on that. Oh, but that's a really, that's a really nice, beautiful <laughs> way of saying that. Um, was, uh, you've already talked about one piece of advice that your dad had given you. Was there any other pieces of advice along the way, either uh, directly told to you um, or something you picked up maybe from someone like Mr. Money Mustache or anything that really stayed with you and you felt kind of impacted you heavily as you, you know, changed the trajectory of your career? I really can't point to anything specific. I mean, yes, the the things that I read, I read a lot of blogs, I read a lot of books. So in, you know, it it culminates into something that I could do something with. But honestly, I can't really point to one specific quote or specific piece of, of, of advice that really landed like my dad's advice. Some people are on the 10 year plan. I'll never forget that for the rest of my life. But other than that, to be perfectly frank, not really. Yeah, I like that. No, I like that super um, candid answer because I think it's important that we always show the spectrum and the nuance of things. I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of the guests are like, oh yeah, well I had this mentor and this mentor, but it sounds like you kind of had your own path where you were just doing a lot of self-education. And you didn't really need direct people telling you things that really were going to impact your life. You were just taking in massive amounts of information from all different areas and applying it to what you had passions about or what you thought there was opportunities with. And I think that shows a nice other side of it to what a lot of our other guests have said, where it's like, oh, make sure you get under the wing of some people that can guide you, your path mm -hmm. and everything like that. You found some virtual, maybe like uh, Mr. Money Mustache, like an early... Um, influencer type of person and just kind of took his information in. I think a lot of people even do, do that with people like, 
like Gary V nowadays, like mm-hmm. that can be their like virtual mentor. And it's just like they take that advice and then try and apply it to their ideas. So I think that's a really nice other side of the coin that, that we don't always hear. Yeah. And I think finding mentors will make it quicker and easier to to get to where you want to be. Like the um, I guess the the nice thing that I had, time was on my side. So I didn't have to make a living. Right. I didn't have to bring in all this money. So I had the time, I had the opportunity, I had the freedom to just kind of go about this myself and figure it out m- myself. So I totally understand not everybody is going to have that that freedom. You need to pull in money. You need to put money on, on the table. And right. finding a good mentor is a great way to to do that. But yeah, for for me, no doubt about it, it's just kind of trudging through the mud, figuring out what, what works and, and just, and to just going forward the best I can. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like you and your wife are kind of mentors for each other too. So that's also very nice. <laughs> yeah. nice. Um, so there, there are a lot of people in the audience, um, you know, who are struggling out there and they know there's this bigger, brighter universe, um, that they want to be a part of in, in terms of entrepreneurship, early retirement, financial freedom, all these, all these things that we talk about and we want to help them get there ASAP and provide them with the tools and information they need to, to join us here. Um, what parting advice do you have for those folks to help them on their path? I would say start now. Don't just quit your job and assume that you're going to start a business and, and, and it's going to take off in six months and you're going to be pulling in all, all this money. No, 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 no. I mean, that <laughs> does work for some people, but those people are the exception, quite frankly. The one piece of advice that I give everybody out there is if you are stuck in this nine to five job that you don't like, and you do want to be an entrepreneur, you want to start your your own thing, do your own thing, start that process while you are working that nine to five job, while you still have that consistent income, while you still have your your network that you can lean on and rely on if you need to. Because that's going to do two things for you. One, it's going to show you whether or not you can actually make money from that that other idea and two whether you even like doing it sometimes it's like oh god this is off the, there's no way i could possibly do it oh my god i've quit my job and i don't like this what 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 am i going to do now that happens so much more than than you probably realize so yes Keep that full-time job, work nights and weekends on your own project, whatever you have passionate about, and build that up while you still have that income. Once you are at the point where you're making maybe half your salary or maybe two-thirds of your salary, then you could start thinking, you know, if I put 50% more effort, I could easily get 50, 60, 70, maybe 100% more income from it. And if you do have that risk tolerance, pull the plug, man, do it. Quit your job and go all in with your business. But I would really highly stress or encourage you not to go all in before it's proven, before you know whether you could handle entrepreneurship. Don't do it yet. I love that. That's great. Um, So I think we had uh, talked about this briefly when we started out. What's the drop date for your book? Can you give us a little info on that? Yeah, my book, Millionaire Habits, is currently available for pre-order on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and Borders. Um, The drop date, the ship date is supposed to be January 11th. That's the goal, and we are sticking to it. So it's going to start shipping that week. There will be a Kindle version um, within the next week or two after the initial launch. It's a hardcover. I like Kindle, but I always like to hold a book in, in, right. in my hand. So I'm glad it's it's available in hardcover, at least initially. Uh, so yeah, January 11th, shipping then. That's so exciting, man. I'm so excited for you. Uh, and the people that can't wait until then to get more Steve Adcock in their life, can you uh, tell them <laughs> where, where can they find you? What's the best, what's the best place to, to, to look you up? Yes. Well... To get more Steve Adcock in your life, um, <laughs> there are two main main avenues. Uh, millionairehabits.us is the website for my for my brand. Awesome. Um, on Twitter, I'm at Steve on Speed. Now that has nothing to do with drugs. On <laughs> Speed was when I in my previous life I just uh-huh. I was reckless. I like driving fast. I created my Twitter account back then. 
so recklessly, re- recklessly created this Twitter account that now people have raised their eyebrows to. <laughs> Too late to change because, you know, Steve on Speed is that's on CNBC and Forbes and all this. stuff. Yeah. there's no way I'll change it now. Stick with it now. But I, it's catchy. It catches people's attention. I love that. That's so good. That's so good. Steve, thanks so much for your time, man. This was awesome. The amount of uh, gems, I think, that are actionable for our audience to really start applying to their lives. I love how you broke it down for them. Thanks so much. I appreciate you guys having me. I really enjoyed it. Speaking on speaking on speed on Steve. What is it? <laughs> Steve Help on speed. <laughs> Go with it. <laughs> Dude, the energy was just off the charts, my man. Thank you so much. Uh, it's always really fun when our guests come on with a ton of energy. And you also had a lot of great gems, like Jonathan said. So thank you so much. We appreciate you. Man, appreciate it, Steve. Being an entreprener is hard. That's why we created findyourfreedompod.com to compile all the resources you need to find your own freedom. Freedom.